the intellectual fall of humanity, enlivened thinking as a path to the spiritual world. In recent lectures I have spoken about human consciousness in our time. It poses one of the tasks of the Anthroposophical Society that must be accomplished. Modern consciousness can be achieved only when the tasks of culture, and indeed of civilization as a whole, are grasped from a spiritual scientific point of view. On several occasions I have tried to characterize what religions mean by the fall of humanity. Religions often say that the fall, parenthesis a fall from divine grace or a fall from innocence through the knowledge of evil, close parenthesis, marks the beginning point of the historical development of humanity. Over the years I have pointed out that the fall encompasses a significant change that has occurred during the course of human development. The growing independence of the human being from the immediate guidance of divine spiritual powers. We know that consciousness of this independence, this autonomy, appeared when the consciousness soul emerged during the first half of the 15th century of the post-Christian or Common Era, CE. We have spoken about this turning point on many occasions. Actually, the entire course of human development preserved in history and myths, was a preparation for this moment in which the individual became conscious of human freedom and independence, a preparation for humanity's struggle on earth to develop its self-generated capacity to discern and to make decisions, rather than to depend upon the direct guidance of divine spiritual powers. Religious statements of belief point to a cosmic earthly event when the spiritual and soul instincts, which guided human morality in ancient times, disappeared as the human capacity for decision-making arose. With regard to the moral impulses of humanity, the way in which religions understood it, human beings placed themselves in opposition to the guiding spiritual powers portrayed in the Old Testament as the Yahweh or Jehovah powers. It is as if human beings from a certain point no longer felt that the divine spiritual powers were active within individuals, and instead that individuals had to become active themselves. Thus with regard to the overall morality of humanity, Human beings felt as if they had become sinful, whereas if they had remained under the instinctive guidance of divine spiritual powers, it would have been impossible to fall into sin. During the time in which the human being was incapable of sin, he remained as sinless as a creature of nature. However, the human being became capable of sinning by virtue of the gifts of freedom and independence in relation to the divine spiritual powers. At this point the consciousness of sinfulness appeared in humanity. As a human being I can be without sin only if I find my way back again to the divine spiritual powers. Whatever I decide entirely on my own bears a sinful element. I can reach a sinless condition once again only by finding my way back to the divine spiritual powers. The consciousness of human sinfulness was at its strongest during the Middle Ages, and that is precisely the time during which an awareness of the intellectuality of the human being began to develop as well. Previously, the intellect had not been regarded as a separate human faculty. And so, as the human being became aware of the faculty of the intellect and began to develop the substance and content of intellectual activity, the intellect, with some legitimacy, became infected by the parallel awareness of the consciousness of sin. 
Initially, human beings did not say that the intellect, as it developed during and after the 3rd and 4th centuries CE, was infected with a consciousness of sin. Only much later, under the influence of scholastic wisdom, during the high Middle Ages, was the consciousness of sin linked to the intellect. The scholastic wisdom of the Middle Ages said that no matter how ingeniously the human intellect can be put to use, we can apply it only to the external physical realm of nature. Through the intellect we can prove the existence of divine spiritual powers, but the intellect cannot lead us to a direct knowledge of divine spiritual reality. We can, however, believe in divine spiritual powers, and we can also believe what has been revealed to us through the Old and New Testaments. Thus the human being, who in earlier times had felt morally sinful, that is, removed or alienated from divine spiritual powers, felt an intellectual sinfulness, as well as a moral sinfulness, during the period of medieval scholasticism. Scholastic wisdom acknowledged that the human intellect could know the physical sense-perceptible world. But during the High and Late Middle Ages, 1100 to 1450 CE, human beings thought that as human beings they were too base, too limited in their own powers, to reach up into the region of knowledge in which they could grasp the spiritual. Even now we do not notice how independent the intellectual fall is from the more general moral fall. But scholasticism transferred the sense of moral sinfulness and human baseness to the intellect. To limit the use of the intellect to the sense-perceptible world was an extension of moral sinfulness, one that by implication disqualified the intellect from investigating spiritual reality. When scholastic wisdom passed into the modern natural scientific perspective, the connection between scholastic wisdom and the old moral sinfulness was completely forgotten. Indeed, the direct connection between scholasticism and modern natural scientific knowledge is often denied. Now, the newer natural sciences also say that there are limits to human knowledge and that the human being has to be satisfied with using the intellect to investigate only the phenomena of the sense-bound physical world. Émile dubois Raymond, for example, claimed that there were limits to scientific research and even to human thinking. That claim is, however, a direct continuation and extension of scholasticism. The only difference is that scholasticism assumed if the human intellect is limited, then the human being must turn to something other than the intellect, namely revelation, when humanity wishes to know something about the spiritual world. In contrast to scholasticism, the modern natural scientific perspective takes one half rather than the whole. It is willing to take revelation as a given, at least if a person presumes the validity of revelation. But then modern science goes further and asserts that the human capacity to know is simply too base, too limited, to be extended to the divine spiritual world. When scholasticism was in full bloom during the high and late Middle Ages, the constitution of the soul was not as it is today. At that time it was assumed that with your intellect you could obtain knowledge from the world of the senses, but you also felt that you could still experience the flowing together of the human being and the sense world by using the intellect. Scholasticism also thought that the human being could rise to revelation when seeking to know something about the spiritual realm that by definition could not be grasped intellectually. But it was not taken into account consciously by the scholastics that into the ideas they put forward about the sense world, 
there also flowed living spirituality. And that is what we must recognize fully today. The concepts of the scholastics were not without spirit, whereas today concepts about the sense world exclude the spiritual. The concepts that the scholastics brought forward about the world of nature did not exclude the participation of the human being, for the scholastics were of the opinion, at least those who were among the scholastic realists, that thoughts came to human beings from without and were not fabricated from within. Today it is often presumed that thoughts do not originate outside the human being. Rather, they are fabricated entirely within the human being and arise out of one's innermost being. Through this fact, we increasingly have come to ignore everything that is not related to the external world of the senses. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution showed the extent to which scientists in the 19th century had dropped everything that was not related to the sense-perceptible world. Previously, Goethe had moved toward a real theory of evolution, at least with regard to plants, and up to a certain point with regard to animals too. However, he did not extend his ideas to the human being. When you examine his writings to see if he might have pursued this direction, you will see that he stumbled whenever he tried to find implications for metamorphosis within the human being. He formulated an outstanding theory of plant metamorphosis and also wrote with insight about animals, but he came to a standstill when he tried to speak about human development or metamorphosis over time. Human intellect, when it is permitted to deal only with the world of the senses, will not be able to discover the full, the true, the essential human being. It is indeed astonishing that Goethe could never say anything about the development of the human being. Goethe himself never applied his theory of metamorphosis to humanity. Guided by anthroposophic insight today, we expect to apply Goethe's theory of metamorphosis far beyond his applications and still remain true to the originator's own methods and principles. How far forward has modern intellectualism brought natural science? It has reached the evolution of animals only up to the apes, and then added on the human being, without being able inwardly to make any headway regarding humanity. The closer investigators come to the higher animals, the greater the difficulty they have forming adequate concepts. It is simply not true that human beings today really understand the higher animals. People merely believe that they understand them. Thus our understanding of the human being has been separated from our understanding of the world because real understanding has been torn out of the concepts we use. Our concepts have become less and less spiritual and the prevailing spiritless concepts which view the human being merely as the end point of the sequential development of the animal realm, now permeate the substance of all thinking. These ideas already flow into children in the early years of their schooling. And if this becomes part of general education, we shall no longer be able to observe the essential nature of the human being. You know that once I tried to approach the entire question of knowledge with a different goal in view. I am referring to my book titled The Philosophy of Freedom and its precursor titled Truth and Knowledge, Readers Aside, also known as Truth and Science, and of Readers Aside. Although a resonance is already apparent in titled Goethe's Theory of Knowledge, published in the 1880s. I have tried to turn the discussion in a completely different direction. I wanted to demonstrate that in the modern era we can put aside a traditional approach to thinking and out of our own inner activity we can arrive at pure thinking. We can discover that a purely will-based capacity for thinking 
is something positive and real when we allow it to work within us. And furthermore, in the philosophy of freedom, I try to reach humanity's moral impulse out of this purified thinking. Over time, human development has proceeded so that we have increasingly accepted the assumption that the human being is too base, too flawed, too weak to act morally. And from that we assumed that the base and limited nature of the human being applies to the intellect as well. We have developed in such a way that what individuals knew about their true humanity became, quote, thinner and thinner, close quote. But beneath the surface, there continued to develop a capacity to go beyond abstract thinking, a capacity in human thinking that is alive and real. There came a point at the end of the 19th century, however, when this capacity to go beyond abstract thinking was not being noticed by human beings. And at the same time, human beings typically believed they no longer had a connection with the divine spiritual. Consciousness of human sinfulness had torn the human being away from the divine spiritual. And the historical forces that came afterward were not yet able to draw humanity back into relation with the divine spiritual. However, in the philosophy of freedom, I wanted to say, look into the depths of your soul. There you will find the remnant of a genuine and energetic thinking arising out of the inner self, a pure thinking that is more than ordinary thinking, a thinking that can generate a feeling imbued knowledge, a thinking that lives in the human will. And this enlivened, pure thinking, working together with the will, can become the impulse for moral actions. In this context, I have spoken about a moral intuition that can be inspired by and permeated with moral imagination. But this can become a living reality only if the path you choose, even in the face of the increasing separation of the human being and the human intellect from the divine spiritual, is the path that leads you once more to the divine spiritual. If you can discover spirituality in nature, then you also will find the spirit in the human being. I said some years ago during a lecture in Mannheim, and it was a lecture, I might add, that has not received much attention, that humanity in its present stage of development is capable of reversing the fall of humanity into sinfulness. The fall of the human being was understood, first of all, as a moral fall, which was extended later to the human intellect, in a way that limited the human capacity of knowing to the realm of nature. But let me emphasize that the human being can achieve knowledge of the spiritual when it has been filtered through pure thinking. In this way, the human being can reverse the moral fall and ascend to the divine spiritual through the spiritualization of the intellect. We have considered what in older epochs was known as the moral fall of the human being. Then we have traced the influence of this moral fall upon the course of human development over time. As a result of our explorations, We now can think about an emerging ideal for humanity. We can think about creating a compensation for the fall along a path that leads to the spiritualization of knowledge and to the renewal of our recognition of the spiritual nature of the cosmos. Through the moral fall of humanity, we have separated ourselves from the gods. Now, by means of a new path of knowledge, we can find our way to the gods again. We must transform descent into ascent. By drawing pure spirit out of your own being, with your own inner energy and strength, you shall be able to grasp firmly the goal and ideal to take seriously the fall of the human being.
Indeed, you must take the fall seriously. Understanding the fall will lead you right into the discussion of the knowledge of nature in our present day. You will need courage in order to use your powers of thinking and understanding to add to the older understanding of the fall, to find the possibility of overcoming the fall through self-generated renewal. You will need courage to manifest what can become of the human being who pursues a genuinely spiritual scientific knowledge born out of our own day and time. As we look back upon the development of humanity, we see that human consciousness places the fall of humanity on earth at the beginning of its historical development. Nevertheless, the fall requires compensation. A balance has to be found by lifting humanity out of sinfulness. And this renewal, this redemption, can occur only during the age of the consciousness soul. Only in our modern era has the historical moment arrived in which the highest ideal of humanity can be achieved through spiritual renewal. Without this development, humanity cannot proceed further. This is what I explained in the lecture I mentioned earlier. In the modern period, the concept of the moral fall of the human being was carried over from the medieval era. And as the natural scientific perspective arose, the intellectual fall of the human being was added to the moral fall. The intellectual fall was the great historical sign, the historical evidence that the spiritual rising beyond the fall would have to begin. What does this spiritual rising beyond the fall, this spiritual ascendance, imply? It means that we must come to a true understanding of the Christ. Those who still grasp something of this understanding, who have not lost the Christ under the influence of newer theology, have said that the Christ is a higher being who came to earth and was incarnated into an earthly body. They have drawn upon the written traditions that proclaimed the Christ. They have even spoken about the mystery of Golgotha, But now the time has come in which the Christ must be genuinely understood. People resist a genuine understanding of Christ, and the way this occurs is characteristic of our time. You see, even if only a spark of Christ is living within them, what must follow from it? They would have to be clear that Christ as a heavenly being came down to earth, he spoke to human beings not through an earthly language. Rather, he spoke out of a cosmic perspective. We too would have to exert ourselves to understand him. We would have to learn how to speak a cosmic language, one that would carry us beyond our earthly experience. We could not limit knowledge to the earthly sphere, for our planet was a new land for Christ our knowledge would have to encompass the entire cosmos. We would have to learn to understand the elements, the movement of the planets, and the constellations of the stars, and their influence in relationship to what occurs on earth. Then we could draw nearer to the language spoken by Christ. Expanding our knowledge so that it encompasses the cosmos as well as the earth belongs to our spiritual rising beyond the fall. For why did it come about that the human being felt compelled to understand only what exists on earth? This occurred because of our consciousness of the fall. We presumed that the human being was unworthy to grasp, to know, to understand the cosmos in the spirituality of its existence beyond our planet. That is the reason why it is said so often that the human being only has the capacity to know what is directly related to the earth. I gave you several examples of this yesterday. It is presumed that the human being can understand the fish only as it lies on the table, or the bird in its cage. The consciousness that the human being can rise above a purely earth-bound knowledge 
does not exist in our so-called civilized natural science. Science typically makes fun of anything that is not earthbound. If you begin to talk about the stars, even that draws ridicule from people with a natural scientific point of view. If we want to hear what is really important about the relationship of human beings to animals, we have to look beyond the earthly sphere. The earthly plane can help us to understand plants, but it is not sufficient to understand the animals on earth. I have already said that we do not fully understand apes, neither are animals in general comprehensible to us. If you really wish to understand animals, you already have to look beyond the narrow confines of the material earth, for animals live under the influence of cosmic forces. I showed you the example of the fish yesterday. I pointed out that the forces of the sun and the moon on water affect the fish. Indeed, the water creates or determines the form of the fish. The same is true for the bird in relation to the air. As soon as you enter the elements, you come into contact with forces that are active within the cosmos. The whole world of animals may be understood by taking into account what lies within the earthly sphere as well as what exists far beyond it. With regard to the human being, this is even more so. But as soon as you begin to speak about what lies beyond the earthly realm, you are met with ridicule. In order to have the courage to speak about what lies beyond the earth, you will have to develop a truly spiritual scientific perspective. As a spiritual scientific researcher, today the strength of your courage will be more important than your intellectuality. Spiritual scientific research is fundamentally a moral task because it is a moral fall that has to be overcome and set aside. First of all, we must learn the language of Christ, the ton uranon, that is, the speech of heaven, in the sense of classical Greek culture. We have to learn this language again in order to understand what the Christ wanted to do on earth. What until now has been referred to as Christendom, and what has been described historically as Christianity, have played roles different from the task we have today. We must learn to understand the Christ as a being whose origins lie beyond the earthly realm. This task is identical with the ideal of raising the human being beyond the grasp of the moral fall of humanity. However, there is a problematic element about formulating this new ideal. You recall that the consciousness of the capacity to sin once made the human being feel humble. In contrast, during our modern period, Human beings very seldom show humility. Often those who think of themselves as the most humble are in fact the most proud and arrogant. The greatest arrogance is found in those who strive for utter simplicity in their lives. They set themselves above everyone else, even above the humble soul searching inwardly for spiritual truths. They say that everything must be sought after in its purest simplicity. Such naive natures who also view themselves as naive natures, are often the most proud and arrogant of all. Nevertheless, during the time of genuine consciousness of the fall of the human being, there used to be truly humble people, and humility was regarded as something valuable in the human being. Since then, people have become more and more arrogant without there being any justification for this. Why? That can be expressed in words I recently brought to your attention. Why has pride become more and more prevalent? Because many, just like the sleepy shepherd in the nativity play, have ignored the admonition, quote, buckle, wake up, close quote. Instead, they fall asleep. There was a time in which human beings felt their sinfulness with wakeful intensity. But now people fall into a drowsy sleep and only dream about a consciousness of the fall. 
Previously, one awakened to the consciousness of the fall and realized that human beings will remain sinful if they do not take measures to bring themselves back to the path that leads to divine spiritual powers. In the past, that realization has awakened human beings. Today, everywhere you look, you will find that individuals have been awakened to a knowledge of sinfulness. But people doze off again. The dreams come and whisper, quote, Causality reigns in the world. What happened in the past gives birth to its consequences in the present. Close quote. And so we look up to the stars and the heavens as if they themselves cause affinities and antipathies among the heavenly bodies, a pattern of thought that we follow even down to forces between atoms and molecules, which are regarded as a miniature cosmic system. And the dreaming went further. The dream ended at the point when it was said that we cannot know anything that lies beyond our experience of the senses. Whenever human beings go beyond the realm of sense experience, modern culture calls this supernaturalism. But where supernaturalism begins, there science is said to end. Then the strident tirades of these dreams are brought into the congresses of natural scientific researchers. We hear Dubois Raymond's discourse, quote, on the limits of the knowledge of nature, close quote. And when the last sounds of the dream fade, sometimes the traces of a dream are not pleasant and it really turns out to be a nightmare, when the speaker in the dream declares that where supernaturalism begins, their science comes to an end, not only the speaker, but also the whole body of natural science researchers slip into a blissful sleep. Listeners, no longer need to activate an inner process of knowing. Everybody can comfort themselves with the certainty that human knowledge is limited to the natural world. And furthermore, there is no possibility whatsoever that the human being can ever reach beyond the limit. The time has come when one can really hear the cry, quote, Buckle! Wake up! The sky is falling! Close quote. But, Modern civilization just yawns. Quote, let it fall. It is old enough to let go. Close quote. That is the state of society today. We have allowed our grasp of knowledge to fall fast asleep. Today's spiritual, scientific, anthroposophic understanding of knowledge can penetrate this sleepiness and resound in a new way. It is possible for the human being to rise beyond the moral fall through self-generated effort. This has to be drawn out of genuine knowledge. And the awakening of human beings today may very well be linked with the growth of pride and arrogance that was formerly only present in a dreamlike manner. Although some anthroposophic circles are not yet ripe enough to rise beyond the moral fall, there is still a lamentably high level of arrogance and false pride. It is part of human nature that the shadow of pride is more likely to prosper than the light-filled potential of human beings. And so, alongside the realization of the need to raise ourselves beyond the moral fall, we also must undertake our own education in the spirit of humility. And we must take in everything in a state of full consciousness, and it is possible to do so. But if pride seems to arise out of knowing, that is a sign that something has gone awry. For when understanding and knowledge are truly present, humility follows quite naturally. It is arrogance to prescribe a program for reform, as if you are implying that you know a social movement or the women's movement from the inside out, and therefore know exactly what would be possible or correct or necessary or the best way to proceed. In such an instance, it is as if you know everything, the issues and the ways to solve them. But in such a case, you do not recognize your own arrogance because you explain matters as if you know everything. 
However, if you have achieved a real understanding of a matter, you remain humble, for genuine knowledge can be achieved, I will express it now in a simple way, only over the course of time. If you are alive with real knowledge and understanding, you know that even the simplest truth can be mastered only with difficulty, and through effort that sometimes lasts for decades. Thus the process of inwardly working through a matter prevents you from becoming arrogant. But we must pay attention within the Anthroposophical Society of being fully conscious of the greatest ideal for humanity today, rising above the moral fall, and at the same time be awake and watchful to avoid the corrosive influence of pride and arrogance. Today the human being needs a strong commitment to truly grasp the being of knowledge, so that we are not satisfied with just knowing a few anthroposophic catchwords about the physical body, the etheric body, reincarnation and so forth, in order to appear to be a model of anthroposophic wisdom. Wakefulness helps us to guard against pride, and it must be cultivated as a new moral quality. It has to be taken into our meditation. Then the rising beyond the moral fall can really come into being, for the experiences that we have in the physical world are the ones that also lead us over into the spiritual world. These experiences must guide us toward devotion to the innermost capacities and strengths of the soul, rather than to promulgating the truths of a particular program. Above all, we must have a sense of responsibility toward every single word that we express about the spiritual world. We have to strive to carry the truth that we have first encountered in the sense-perceptible world into the realm of spiritual knowledge. If we are not accustomed to working strictly with the facts that can be learned in the physical sense world and to supporting what we say with observable facts, then we will not be ready to speak with truthfulness when we talk about the Spirit. We cannot expect to grow accustomed to truthfulness only after we enter the spiritual world. Truthfulness is something that we have to bring with us. On the one hand, within the consciousness of civilization today, facts are seldom taken into account. And on the other hand, science rejects the facts that could lead research in the right direction. I want to point out just a few instances from among many examples of this phenomenon. There are insects that are vegetarian when they are fully grown. They never eat flesh, not even other insects. But when the female of this certain kind of insect looks for a place to lay her fertilized eggs, she places them inside another insect. The host insect is filled with the eggs of the insect mother. After a time of incubation, the eggs release the larva within the body of the host insect. The larva, which will gradually change into adult insects, are not vegetarian. They cannot be vegetarian for they must feed upon the flesh of the host insect. Only after they have completed their metamorphosis into mature insects are they able to go without eating the flesh of the host insect. The insect mother is herself a vegetarian and knows nothing of eating flesh, but she lays her eggs for the next generation within the body of another insect. Moreover, if these larvae would eat, for example, the stomach of the host insect in which they were embedded, then the larvae would soon have nothing more to eat. If they ate any organ of the host that was essential for the life of the host insect, the host would die, and so would the larva. And so, what do the insect larvae do when they emerge from their eggs? They reject eating any organ that is essential for the life of the host, and eat only what is not needed to keep the host insect alive. When the larvae become insects and are mature enough to leave the host insect, they become vegetarian and continue their lives in the manner of their adult mother. You can see in this example that a remarkable intelligence holds sway in nature. 
When you really study nature closely, you will discover this commanding intelligence everywhere. Then, with regard to your own intellect, you can think with greater humility. First of all, your own intelligence is not nearly as great as the intelligence that guides nature. And, second, human intelligence is like a little bit of water that you take from a lake in a pitcher. The human being is actually like the pitcher that is filled with intelligence taken out of a much greater intelligence of nature itself. Intelligence is everywhere in nature, and everywhere this intelligence consists of wisdom. Whoever attributes the origin of intelligence to the human being is just about as clever as someone who says, quote, You are telling me there is water in that lake or in that stream? That is nonsense. There is no water there. There is only water in my pitcher. The pitcher has produced the water. Close quote. Similarly, the human being who thinks that intelligence can come only from within the human being is incorrect. For in reality, we merely draw intelligence out of the general sea of intelligence. It is necessary that we really take into account the facts of nature. But the facts of nature are put aside when Darwinian theory is insisted upon or when the facts are forced into the molds of modern materialistic perceptions. The real facts challenge every corner and crevice of modern materialistic presumptions. Today we suppress the facts. It is true that facts are reported, but only anecdotally, as an aside to mainstream science. Therefore the real facts of nature that are presented only as anecdotal asides in the study of science, do not carry sufficient weight in the scientific education of the general public. The facts and observations of the natural world need to be available to the common person. The real facts that are known are not presented in their true significance, and untruthfulness is used to justify leaving out or suppressing the most striking and convincing phenomena. When it comes to rising beyond the moral fall of humanity, however, we must first educate ourselves about truthfulness in the world of sense perception, and then we shall be able to carry over this education, this accustomed way of approaching the world of the senses, into the spiritual world. This prepares us to be truthful in the spiritual world as well, Otherwise, we are in danger of telling other people the most unbelievable stories about the spiritual world. The person who is accustomed to approaching the physical world inaccurately, untruthfully, and inexactly shall be able to relate only untruths about the spiritual world. If we really grasp this ideal, it can consciously become a reality in the anthroposophical society and if we can authenticate what arises out of such a consciousness, then the derogatory assertion that the anthroposophical society is a religious sect will evaporate. Of course, the critics of anthroposophy will say all kinds of things that are untrue, but as long as we give them some cause for their criticisms, we cannot be indifferent to the truth or falsity of what opponents are saying. The Anthroposophical Society has worked its way out of sectarianism, although it may be said that it had such roots during the years it was connected to the Theosophical Society. That prejudice can be laid to rest since the founding of the Anthroposophical Society in 1913. However, many members of the Anthroposophical Society have not taken this into account and still love sectarianism. It has come about that some long-term members of the Anthroposophical Society who almost wanted to break away from the Society when it wished to transform its sectarian origins into a society conscious of its worldwide tasks have more recently made a different leap. Equally distant from sectarianism, if you look closely at its essential being, is the movement for religious renewal. But the movement for religious renewal has given a number of long-term anthroposophists 
the opportunity to say that although the Anthroposophical Society has continued to weed out its sectarian aspect, in the movement for religious renewal we shall be able to practice and nurture the religious aspect of Anthroposophy. And so it may come about through Anthroposophists themselves that the movement for renewal could become a desert of sectarianism, something that does not need to occur. We can see that if the Anthroposophical Society wishes to become a reality, the courage to lift ourselves once again into the spiritual world must be actively cultivated. Then, both art and religion can blossom in the Anthroposophical Society. If we take into account the nature of our artistic forms, we shall recognize that they live in the being of the anthroposophical movement itself, and time and again must be discovered anew. Likewise, the true deepening of religion lives within those who find their way back to the spiritual world, and who take seriously the rising beyond the fall through their own efforts. But we must also eliminate in ourselves any dependence on sectarianism, for the inclination to sectarianism is always egotistical. That will help us to avoid the problem of pressing forward into spiritual reality just to satisfy a mystical appetite, which basically amounts to egotistical excess. All the talk about the anthroposophical society becoming too intellectual is put forward by those who want to avoid an experience of spiritual substance and would much rather enjoy the pleasure of nurturing their soul appetite within a mystical haze of nebulousness. Selflessness is a requisite for true anthroposophy. It amounts to a kind of soul egoism when anthroposophic members themselves resist true anthroposophy and enter only into a sectarian existence which satisfies a feeling of delight in the soul that is completely egotistical. These are the things that we must take into account if we are to accomplish our tasks. We shall not lose our warmth toward anthroposophic striving, our sense for the artistic, or our religious sensitivity. We shall avoid what must be avoided, an inclination toward sectarianism. This attraction to sectarianism has introduced a quality of disintegration within the society, for it often draws us into forming cliques. Cliques within the anthroposophic movement seem to be an expression of relationship, but they actually lead to a negative kind of relationship, that of sectarianism. We must come back to the cultivation of a world consciousness, so that our opponents, who with full intent want to say what is untrue, are the only ones to say that the anthroposophical society is a sect. We must strongly resist the characterization of the anthroposophic movement as a sect. We should also object to describing the movement for religious renewal as sectarian, for the movement itself is not conceived of in this way. These are the matters that we must clarify in our thinking. We have to understand the innermost being of anthroposophy and recognize that anthroposophy can give human beings a cosmic consciousness. Most certainly this is not a sectarian perspective. For these reasons, it has been necessary for me to speak about avoiding a narrow definition of the tasks of the Anthroposophical Society.